Every even integer greater than 2 can be expressed as the sum of two primes. Christian Goldbach, 1742. I'm going to show you why this well-known conjecture is provable using simple set theory. This is a solution that requires logic, not much number theory. It should be understandable by anyone with more than a passing interest in this conjecture. If you don't think my conclusions are correct, you should at least agree with many of the insights I present here. This is not speculative or crackpot material. First, it's obvious there are many more combinations for the addition of two primes than there are positive integers. For brevity, let me call these pairs of primes partitions. So after 12, every known even number has two to many partitions, with the emphasis on many. In fact, taken as a trend line, the partition count exceeds the square root of n. Now this is the value of the statistical approach in providing clarity. The surprising result runs counter to the notion that the exact summation of two primes to a given n is somehow unusual. It is, in fact, a garden variety property of even numbers. When you see a property that is increasing at this rate, you cannot consign it to a matter of chance. Partitions, like primes, grow like weeds, but systematically. It really requires a suspension of disbelief to think there exists an integer of vast magnitude for which it is false, for which there are zero partitions. Remember that the conjecture only asks for one partition, one pair of primes that sum to a given n. Part of a misunderstanding is how we think about an even integer. An even integer n, in the context of Goldbach's conjecture, is an integer that contains every prime less than n. That is, n is a set of elements that are every prime except 2, meaning 3 to the largest prime less than n. I want to explain this further. Take an even number and divide it by 2. We can then align the numbers so that 1 half is incrementing down and 1 half is incrementing up. When you reach 3, on shall we say the left side, we have reached n minus 3 on the right side. All partitions are obviously the result of a prime aligning on both sides. Take a number like 210, and we see a remarkable symmetry, mirror symmetry, in the distribution of primes. This number has 19 partitions. This is on the high end of density because this is a special number, a primorial. It's the product of 2 times 3 times 5 times 7, the first four primes. So what has the prime factors of a number, a multiplicative property, to do with the additive property of partitions? It turns out that the predictable combinatorics of least or smallest prime factors of the composite numbers in this case 2, 3, 5, and 7, is extremely predictable. Hence, the positions of prime partitions are also predictable to a point. Now, there's an interesting counterfactual argument that I want to tell you about. It concerns large prime gaps and partition counts. It turns out there can be spans four times greater than the largest theoretical prime gap without breaking the conjecture. For example, supposing there were no primes greater than 500, the decay in partitions is gradual till reaching zero at 964. That's a span from n to nearly 2n, whereas the largest theoretical prime gaps are less than n and one and one-fifth times n, a result that goes back to 1952 by Jitsuru Nagora. And there are tighter bounds than this that have been found since. Is it possible that Goldbach's conjecture was already found true in 1952? 
The key to understanding the gradual decay of partitions is to project their distribution into a graph. Here we see that partitions follow an exact prime sequence on slopes that conform to a simplest linear function. Each diagonal line crosses an even n just once. The set of partitions for a given n is the result of many slopes crossing n, some intersecting and some not. If you understand what I mean, proving that one slope intersects every n is the same as solving Goldbach's conjecture. But I'm getting slightly ahead of myself. What I want you to see is that for 502, 502, the first partition is 3 and 499. Now draw the slope to the largest partition for this diagonal, 499 and 499, for an even integer of 998. This is why partition decay can span from n almost to 2n. The partitions of a diagonal are entirely predicated on the prime sequence. Every diagonal begins with 3 and n minus 3. Taking any even n, for which the first partition is 3 and n minus 3, the next n, which is n plus 2, has a partition 5 and n minus 5. n plus 4 has a partition 7 and n minus 7 n plus 8 has partitions 11 and n minus 11. You get the idea. Look at the right column for an example. As you follow the diagonal down, you'll find exactly this rule of addition, where the gaps between n's are the same as the gaps between p's. You might say that diagonals are in some sense orthogonal to even integers. It doesn't matter what size the integer is, the prime distribution does not bear a direct relationship when the smaller element of the partition is considered. Here is the strongest heuristic evidence of Goldbach's conjecture, a graph of the smaller element of each partition. We see in the starkest way how the prime elements overlap each other. As the number of primes less than half n increases, the frequency of overlaps exceeds the growth of primes because of the possible combinations of prime elements. Combinatorially, there really is no question about this. There can never be fewer than one partition for every even number. Here I'm setting up a simple set theoretic argument that's based upon the topology, quote unquote, of numbers that I've explained so far. You'll see here that I'm focusing on one partition, 7 and 19. I'm illustrating that the partition is, in a real sense, overdetermined by three intersecting lines. I'm going to take those lines apart into sets, then put them back together again. The purpose for this to show that every even number must have at least one such intersection for the distribution of primes to be intersectionally consistent. Here is the linear function of the graph I have presented. Beyond this point, I will not attempt to explain the solution algebraically. I will leave this to a mathematician if necessary, rather than an empiricist like me. However, note that in this graph of prime distribution and intersections, the x and y intercepts correspond with a simple linear function in quadrant 4 of the coordinate plane. For the rest of this presentation, you will need only your common sense understanding of sets. Indeed, Venn diagrams. Let's think about sets as they relate to partitions in an elementary way. Set 1. There is a set that contains every prime except 2 less than or equal to n divided by 2.
Set 2. There is a set that pairs each prime except 2 with every prime equal to or greater than this prime and less than or equal to n minus 3. Set 3. There is a set that is a sequence of partitions taken diagonally, using diagonally in the sense I've defined from an even n where the first partition is 3 and n minus 3. The elements of set 1 have a 1 to 1 correspondence with the first element of each set 2. Since there is a set 2 for every first element, there should be at least one intersection of set 1 and the set of set 2's with a pair of prime elements of partition. Each diagonal begins with 3 as the first element of the first partition. That means every set 3 has all possible partitions for 1p, excluding 2, as the first element, and every p as the second element. Each partition of set 3 is the intersection of every set 2. One could say this is a definitional statement of a partition. It is the intersection of a set 2 and a set 3. Now consider every set 3 and realize that it must have an intersection with one unique partition of each even n, the first element of which belongs to set 1. So do you see it? Every vertical line or set intersects every even n because it's deterministically true that every such line is a consecutive prime number. At least one diagonal line or set must intersect the same even n as in the vertical line because it's deterministically true the smaller element of every slope is a consecutive prime number. And so we have it, the solution set. Taking the set of all the diagonal sets, the set of all partitions, at least one partition, must be at the intersection of set 1 and set 2 with set 3. If this partition did not exist, there would be a prime element missing from the set of diagonal sets, and this would be impossible.